Well, it's a beautiful day out. Amen to that. Is it super? How many of you guys know what we had going on this week up at church? Raise your hand if you think you know what we had going up at church. Yep, you're right. We had a vacation Bible school up at church this week, and we had uh, a few hundred kids. We had a couple hundred leaders that helped during that time period, and it was a great, great week. Uh, There's nothing better than seeing kids that are young love their church because here's why. When you love your church then and you think church is fun, then it goes higher. They love God and they think God is fun. It's the reverse. If you ever grew up in a church and you thought that church was boring, then oftentimes kids think that God's boring. And we know that that's just the opposite. God is exciting. He's real. He's with us. So it's just a great week for everybody. Uh, they gave out one gift at the end of the week for everybody, and it was this. Okay. Now raise your hand if you do not know what this is. Raise your hand. Okay, you don't, this is called a fidget spinner, okay? That means you're above the age of 60, probably, if you don't know what this is. And I asked this in the first service. This is a modern-day wheelo. You guys remember the wheelo? You know, you know, the thing you think, raise your hand if you know what a wheelo is. Yeah, it was the first service, didn't hardly any of them knew it. That's, this is just a modern-day wheelo, so it's just a great time. So here's kind of the bottom line what I wanted to tell you this morning. We put on this uh, uh, vacation Bible school, and because of your generosity, we don't charge anybody anything. And we actually dropped quite a a pretty big number on this vacation Bible school. So these kids and families can come and just love Jesus. So we just wanted to thank you all for your generosity, that we're able to give away stuff, point people towards Jesus, put on what I think is the best best vacation Bible school, uh, certainly in the area. I think it's just a wonderful one. So I thought it'd be great, uh, first of all, to thank you, but secondly, watch and see this little three-minute video, and you can see uh, where your dollar's paid. For all you guys that served, you can see the smiling faces. So I hope you enjoy this.
Yeah, it was good. You know, close to 300 different grade schoolers and preschoolers. And, you know, the cool thing is like over 200 volunteers. So you guys should give yourselves a round of applause for that. That was awesome. Again, if you're visiting with us today, we want to welcome you. And we would love for you to go to who the... Who are you? I'm Herc Noblet. I'm one of the pastors. I mean, I know who you yeah. are, but somebody may not yeah, know. Yeah, I know that. I, but you're getting sometimes forgetful. So maybe that was... A, yeah, so... Uh -huh, so. We, we, yeah, okay. I still so, know who you are. Uh -huh. So, um, but if you're visiting with us today, we'd love for you to go out in the information table, and they'll give you a packet there. The packet's got a couple coupons. You can get a free beverage at our cafe, or you can also go back to the bookstore and get a free T-shirt, and anybody with you will get one as well. And that, that brochure will just tell you a little bit about the church and what we do and why we do the things we do. Then there's also a few announcements, mainly for you. Um, one is that we don't take communion together as a group during the service. Um, so if you're used to that, or just not sure what that's all about, you can go back on your own and go to a room right behind this wall if you go through the bookstore into the reflection room and you can remember why we gather here and you can take communion on your own and, and, uh, and do that. There's also a place to write down prayer requests where people will pray for those over the week and you can actually have somebody in there pray with you as well. Um, and then we don't take an offering during this service. So again, we want you to sit back, just enjoy this service, let it be a, our, our gift to you. Um, but if Oak Bridge is your home and you guys believe in the mission and the mission is to make followers of Jesus at all ages. You saw the VBS. You hear a lot about our summer programs with students and then a lot of things with, with everybody else. If you guys can give with, a, with joy in your hearts and a smile on your face because you believe in the mission of Oak Bridge, then we would ask you to give generously. So, mm -hmm. uh, a couple other quick announcements. How many of you guys have ever came here and there's not been a parking spot? Any of you? Or you struggled to find one? Yeah, our parking oftentimes is max, maxed out at key times of the year. And we've thought about, well, what can we do about that? So we own, maybe you guys don't know, we own all the green space, about another two and a half acres, almost all the way down to the uh, uh, highway down there. And so we've looked into turning that into parking spaces, but the bid we got back, we could put in another 200 parking spaces down there, and the lowest bid we've gotten back roughly has been $2 million. Yeah, so it's like $10,000 of space is what they believe that would cost to, to uh, put retaining walls and water retention ponds and all that other stuff. So if somebody wants to give $10,000, you can get your own parking spot. That's How exactly that right. Be? If you want to give ten grand, we give you your own spot. That's very good. Uh -huh. And uh, so with that said, I just kind of wanted you to know something. We're, we're not going to do that. You know, that just doesn't make sense for us uh, financially. So Dairy Queen, I just tell you July 9th is a big day for us. July 9th. Say July 9th. Everybody say July 9th. Here's why it's a big day. Dairy Queen lets us use 35 spots every single week, and they have since we've been here with no complaint. In fact, there was a week the owner told me that their workers had to park over at the bank and behind Culver's because we had taken all their spots. So he said, no problem. We love what you guys are doing. You can use our parking lot anytime. Those 35 spaces times 10,000 would cost us $350,000 to replicate. So we thought, you know what? Let's pick a day, and we're going to call it July 9th. It's a Sunday. Where let's set a record for Dairy Queen by buying all their stuff as a way of saying thanks that they let us use that every single week. Wow, wow that, that's really sacrificial of us to go over there and buy fast food and ice cream. Oh, no, I know, that's it? right. Uh -huh. but, but here's the deal. So we want to set a record. So I said, you bring your workers. I want your workers to be complaining on Monday about how busy they were. So all day, and here's what he said. He said, I'll do one better for you. He says, I'll, make, I'll take a percentage of what you guys give, and I'll donate it to your children's wing because of what you guys are doing over there. So that's what he said. So look, what I'm asking you to do is, you might have a favorite ice cream that day, whatever there is, Ted Drew's, somebody else. Go to Dairy Queen and buy as much as you can. Buy their cakes to go. Let's, let's sell out of everything that they have over there. Let's get where they say, sorry, no more hamburgers. No, the ice cream machine's down, right? Let's, let, let's, we can do that. Can we do that together? Okay, thanks. This is a way of saying thanks. Second thing is, uh, I don't know if you guys know it, but we're one of the few churches in the country uh, led by Katie and her team over there, all the people that have said, we need a, a, a sensory needs room for our special needs kids. And they're building a sensory needs room over there for special needs. You guys should applaud for this, by the way. But we have certain things we want to put in that room that would be uh, right for what those kids are looking for, certain chairs and certain things. So we decided, you know what, to fund that, here's what we'll do is, we have 4th of July shirts that we sell every year like this. And 
of every dime we make is going to go to that sensory needs room to supply that room with chairs, tables, the stuff that they need to perform that ministry. But I need your help. You guys can come out. Go ahead and come out here right now and show us this right now. I need your help. Out in that table hey, out that's front. that's your cue. Get out here. Come on out come here. On, yeah, come up. on out. Yep. Uh, I need you guys to buy these. These are 10 bucks a shirt. Okay, you can see what they got. They're doing their models for you. <laughs> Kenzie, perfectly love it. That's it. So you got four or five styles. You can wear these for 4th of July. <laughs> These are 10 bucks, but here's the bottom line. You're helping the sensory needs room, special needs kids. You're doing a great thing for us because you guys can support that if you can out front. We'd appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with that said, so I want to say a word of prayer for us. Father, just thank you. Thank you that you've, uh, we don't have to beg for you to be here. That you've told us where we gather in your name, when we gather around the fame of your son, Jesus that your spirit is here, that you're here, that Christ walks with us. This is a place where uh, you do heart surgery today. Miracles happen. Things are happening in our lives just in this morning that can change us and change us forever. Father, I pray for all the people that are in the valley low that are just trying to hunt for some air, just to breathe, just to get through the next thing. I pray that you help them, Father. Um, know that you're with them. I pray for the people that are... Um, just disappointed at times with how things are going in their life. I pray that you touch them a little bit more today and say that there's hope and that you're with them. Father, I pray for those of us that, you know, just everything seems to be going well, that we don't lose sight of the struggle of others. We don't lose sight that this world can be a tough place and we don't lose sight of the gratefulness that we have for our lives, for what you've given us, love and, and hope and forgiveness. Father, may today be a day where we come to you boldly, where we feel your presence. We open our hearts. We take down those walls of stone, and we say, we're here for an hour, dear God. We're yours. Touch us, speak to us, move us, however you choose to. Father, we thank you for this place. I thank you for all the people that are here that serve and give so generously. Dear God, guide us, touch us deeply. It's in your son's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Let's stand and sing to our king.
for the first time last week and we introduced another song last week as well that I love and here in a few moments we're going to sing another song that a lot of us have maybe never heard before that I think is going to help us connect with God and and I love when we sing new songs and fresh songs and fresh lyrics but I don't want to blow past them and so I kind of want to lean into what we were just singing together and wrote down a, a few words that I want to share and what we're singing there is show us your glory show us your glory, and it's this big church word, and we've probably heard it, but what does glory mean anyways, right? And so I, I started looking and thinking about it, and glory means the splendor or bliss of heaven, a special cause for pride, respect, or delight. In fact, the dictionary definition of glory is magnificence or great beauty. And I know what great beauty means, but that actually led to another Google search of what is the definition of magnificence. And the answer was something that is magnificent. I said, okay, awesome. Um, what does magnificent mean? And this word simply means something or someone who's extravagant, elaborate, or striking. Something or someone who is very good and excellent. So really what we're singing together, which I love, it's the beginning of a service. We're saying today, God, show to us who you are. Show us your character, your beauty, your splendor, and your goodness. And do you know there was this specific time period in, in history that stretched out over a lot of years, you can read about it in the Old Testament, where this had not yet happened. People had seen His glory in part, but the fullness of His glory had not yet been revealed. His goodness, His splendor, His beauty in full had been withheld. But that time period is now long gone. As I was singing this song a couple weeks ago, kind of preparing my heart to sing it together as a congregation, thinking on this song and praying this song, show us your glory. It's as if God said loud and clear, I already have. I've already shown him to you in full and his name is Jesus, the healer, the comforter, the restorer, the savior, the king of glory. I've shown him to you, but I'll show you again. So what we're really singing today, just to where we're clear, we're saying, show us Jesus. We need to see Jesus, which fires me up if we're really meaning what we're singing, because the moment that we see Jesus, like the song says, we are changed. When we truly encounter him, anything is possible. So I just wanna remind us right now of something we've probably already heard before, but in the presence of God, in the presence of the goodness and the glory of Jesus, the devil has to run prison doors fling open, chains fall off, sin says goodbye. When we see Jesus, darkness runs for cover, fear bows, lives are healed, and love invades our souls. When we see Jesus, joy takes over, and peace floods who we are. When we see Jesus, transformation takes hold, 
salvation comes running in and Jesus changes our lives. And this might sound weird to some of us in the room, but I have to believe if that's true, in this moment, things are shifting. Things are shifting in our hearts and in our minds in the presence of God. I believe miracles are taking place all over this room. So I just wanna join our voices with the reality of what is taking place in this room yet again, saying, hey, fear, you gotta go. Hey, Jesus, you're gonna come in and you change everything. So let's sing these lyrics together. You are sure you are life. 
introduce another new song so why don't you guys take a seat and uh, it's, it's a really easy song to catch on to but why don't you guys uh, reflect on the lyrics a little bit and then once you catch on once we give you a little opportunity to catch on I'll, I'll have you stand later in the song from the dark
You guys can be seated. I'll run to win the prize. I will run the race that's marked out for my life. My sin's gotta go, it's holding me back. My sin's gotta go, it's taking me off track. Lust, pride, greed, watch out. You're about to be attacked. I'm not scared of you because the same power that conquered the grave lives in me. And the same God who defeated you forever has set me free. So I won't look back. I won't focus on mistakes. I'll fix my eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of my faith. I won't slow down. I won't ever quit. I won't sit out. I've been made for this. When times get tough, I'll keep going. When life gets hard, I'll keep moving. When all seems lost, I'll keep believing. And when I want to quit, I'll keep proving that Jesus is who he says he is and that Jesus does what he says he'll do. He'll finish the work that he started in me, and he'll finish the work that he started in you. So let's run, and let's run together. Let's run to win the race. So when we finally enter into forever, we can say, I fought the good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. All right, so every year we go whitewater rafting with our obturns. How many of you guys have ever been whitewater rafting before? Okay, so not many of you. There's a decent amount of you, I guess. And s- super fun, okay, like crazy fun, but also pretty intimidating, especially if you've never gone before. And so last year, last summer, summer of 2016, was my first ever time going whitewater rafting. And I was not just scared, I was horrified, okay? I was so scared. And one of the reasons that I was so scared is because before this experience that I was about to embark in, when the whitewater rafting, uh, I had an experience with fast moving water, just one um, before this, and it, it wasn't great, okay? And I, I've shared this story before, showed the video. It was actually in January of 2015. Look back in the archives, so if you've seen it, I apologize. But one time I was kind of at a waterfall with some friends, and, and I decided it would be a good idea to climb up this waterfall and slide down it, okay? And I didn't know anybody was going to tape it, but they caught it on, on video. So we can watch the screens here, and we'll, we'll throw it up there. <laughs> See, but I'm not a hardcore type guy. Like, no, I was just trying to have a fun ride. That but was that fun? fun for me. That was so awesome. That was not a fun ride. <laughs> So, so 
So I was nervous, okay? I was nervous to go out water rafting, uh, partly because of this experience. And it's scary. You, you, you show up to this facility, and they show you this video. And the video, in my opinion, it, they should reword a lot of it. They're like, you know, you watch this video. It's this kind of intro thing. They're like, welcome to the Okoye River, and thank you for choosing ROC to guide your trip and help lead you to your death. We want to let you know that if you don't follow protocol, this trip could be fatal, okay? So the first thing you need to know is there are large, sharp rocks lurking right underneath you. And so be very careful. And, and one thing is, if you fall out, you're going to be tempted to stand up and try and walk back to the raft. But please do not do that because if you do, your foot's going to get stuck. You're going to flip forward and you're going to suffocate while drowning to death. And we do not want you to drown. And, 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 and here, here's, here's, here's my favorite part. They're, they're, they're going on and on. And, and, and they, they say, and, and if you notice that there's a large drop off in front of you, if you notice there's a large cliff in front of you, just sit up straight and hope for the best. We hope you have a great trip and 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 I'm like the whole time the first year I'm like freaking out you know I'm scared I'm nervous but I will admit I, the second year is great fun as you watch all the first timers get super scared as they watch this video and then you get on a bus and and you take about a 30 minute bus ride to where you kind of the takeoff spot for this rapid and so I thought you know what I'm going to sit by one of the raft guides and the raft guide will help calm my nerves and this and that. And so I go and I sit by this raft guide who's going to be responsible for my life, 18-year-old girl who weighs about 100 pounds. And, and, and I trust her though, I did. And so we're, we're, at the, we're at the back of the bus and she was so funny. I don't know if she was trained to do this or what, but she told horror story after horror story after horror story from people on the Okoe River. And so I'm thinking, you know, the whole time I'm trying to stay cool and like, you know, be this super manly buff 24 year old guy that I am. Right. And so I'm just trying to play it cool. And, and, and then I say, has anybody ever like died out here? And she goes, I don't know about on rafts, but like last week there was a regular who, who kayaked and yeah, he actually just died a few days ago. And I'm like, oh, oh, good, yeah, awesome. And, and, and then we're, we're towards the end and this is when I lost it again. I'm trying to control my emotions. I'm not very good at that. And so we get to the end and I, I didn't really know what a dam was, okay? I, I, I was homeschooled. I, I just, I didn't know what a dam was. I, I thought again, I'm thinking maybe it's just a wall. I don't, I don't know. And so we get to the beginning of this and there's this big, like, 15-foot drop-off where water is just going crazy. And the girl looks at me and goes, that's the first rapid. That's where we start. We go down that. And I'm like, nope, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I've had enough. You've been really, really funny so far. But I am not, I'm not going down this rapid. And she's like, oh, my goodness, chill out. It's the dam. I'm like, oh, sorry, funny joke. I didn't know what a dam was. I was homeschooled. Sorry. <laughs> and... And, and then right, right where the dam kind of stops, is, it's where you start. And so you kind of get thrown into the fire and you go. And I had a blast my first year. It was so fun. And so this year, I had like no nerves at all. My heart wasn't pounding. And so my bus ride this year consisted of, hey, Jordan, how you feeling? <laughs> you look a little bit nervous. Hey, Hannah, you look a little bit scared. Are you scared? Hey, Meredith, you look like you're gonna pass out. Are you gonna pass out? Hey, Christian, you look like you already passed out and woke back up. Is everything okay? Like, guys, you're probably not gonna die. There aren't many deaths out here. And if you do, we get to see Jesus. It's a win-win, right? And so, so, so then we, so then we, we go and, and, and it's, it's, it's fun. It's, it's, it's a good time. And, and the reason that I kind of share this story is I think first timers every year when we go whitewater rafting, at least the strong majority of them, they aren't like super pumped to go whitewater rafting for the sake of whitewater rafting at first. They're just not. They're nervous. They're like, I don't know about all this. Do you know what the main motivator is for them getting in that raft and staying in that raft is? It's the end. It's the end. When they get to finish, when they get to stand up and say, I did it. I finished. This is awesome, the feeling of accomplishment, and then they get to go to the damn deli, right? Like, like there's a reward. It's really called the damn deli, okay, so chill out. It's, it's at, you know, whatever. Um, it's first service, people started yelling at me. I'm like, oh my goodness, it's what the restaurant's called, okay? And, and, and so that's, that's, that's kind of the reason. I mean, everybody likes a good reward. And I want to acknowledge today, what we're going to talk about today is as Jesus followers, we have a great reward. And I believe this reward is to motivate us to win our race. And so that's what we're going to talk about in part four of how to win the race. The first week we talked about uh, sin 
and the importance of getting rid of the sin in our lives. And I didn't say it, the Hebrew writer says it. He says, throw off the sin that so easily entangles, get rid of it, get rid of the stuff that slows you down, trips you up and keeps you from living the life that Jesus has called you to live, get rid of it. And then the second week we talked about perseverance and endurance and reaching the finish line, even in the midst of challenges and difficulties that might come our way. And these two things are challenging, they're difficult. I'm sure there have been times in our lives where we feel like we can't get rid of the sin in our lives. I'm sure there have been times in some of our lives where we're thinking, I just want to give up. I want to quit. I want to throw in the towel. But what we talked about last week is I think a lot of times it's so hard because we make it so hard. The Hebrew writer says in this passage, he lets us know, hey, these two things are attainable. Throwing off the sin, it's attainable. Enduring till the end, it's attainable. And the awesome thing about this is he doesn't give us like an antiquated list of 20 things that we need to do and follow. He just says, fix your eyes on Jesus. Focus on Jesus. Think about Jesus. Obsess over Jesus. He is to be your motivation and your help as you, as you strive to win the race. And so today we're gonna talk about another motivation that I've already kind of hinted at. And so we're gonna read Hebrews 12, one and two. First service, we did pretty good at this, guys. So there's pressure on. How many of you guys have this memorized? Anybody have it memorized, ready to recite it out loud? <laughs> Is there one hand? Oh, yes. All right, so me and you, we're gonna do it, okay? So, so, so let's throw it up on the screen. Let's throw it up on the screen. This is the practice round. The second time, I think you guys might have it more memorized than you think, okay? And then we're gonna take it down. I said we were gonna do it. All right, and so we're gonna try and, and recite it by memory. So here we go. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Okay, so we're going to take this down, and we're going to do it again. All right, so here we go. Therefore... Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's pretty good, awesome, well done. <laughs> and so today we're gonna focus on for the joy set before him. Those words right there, for the joy set before him. That passage, those words let us know that for Jesus, while he was on the cross, there was a reward. There was a joy that he had in front of him. When he was on the cross, there was something, there was a joy that motivated him to stay on that cross and to finish his course and to win his race. Because if you've been in church for a while, maybe you didn't know this, but Jesus wasn't like a victim of human plans and this unjust murder. Jesus could have gotten down from the cross in an instant, in a moment. Jesus willingly hung on this cross for six hours for the joy set before him, and I believe that this joy is to be our joy. And I believe this motivation is to be our motivation. And that's what we're gonna look at. And the way that we're gonna start is by looking at Hebrews chapter 11. And, and again, if you've been in church for a while and you've been coming and you've read your Bible, you've probably maybe heard of Hebrews chapter 11. If you're new to this whole thing, that's awesome. Hebrews chapter 11 is just a couple pages in your Bible towards the end of the story. and. And it's a powerful passage of scripture and section and portion of scripture, and it talks about faith. And it goes through really all of the heroes of our faith who said, who spoke words of faith, and they lived amazing lives defined by faith. And, and at the very beginning of the chapter, it gives, you, it gives you the definition of faith, probably the most common definition of faith in all of Christianity. And it says, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not See, And then he goes on to talk about men and women who lived by this faith. And so he, he, he says, Abel was amazing and he lived by this faith. 
Enoch lived by this faith. Noah lived by this faith. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Sarah lived by this faith. And he kind of gives some explanations as to how they did this. And then he goes on to write this, which I love in Hebrews chapter 11. He says this, all these people were still living by faith when they died. So you can live by faith and you can die in faith. And this is what these people did. They didn't even receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. Think about this. These men and these women lived lives defined by faith, and the passage tells us this, because they understood that they were foreigners and strangers on this land. They knew that this wasn't the end. This wasn't the end. They looked ahead to something that was greater and something that was ahead of them. So if I get the reward now, that, that's really irrelevant because the reward is coming later. This isn't my home. It goes on to say this in verse 14. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country that they had left, they would have had the opportunity to return. This is a side note, but how relevant is this for maybe some of us in the room today who are tempted to quit? who are tempted to give up. Life with God is too hard. It's too challenging. I don't know if I'm ever gonna measure up. And you're, you're listening to lies and you're hearing things and you're thinking about giving up. And maybe the reason is, is because you're looking back. You're looking back at the country that you once lived in in a spiritual sense. And you're looking back at the life that you once lived before you, you were carrying out the assignment that Jesus has given to you and, and you're tempted to quit. But this passage lets us know that there's nothing back there for you. This passage says, if they would have looked back, if these heroes of the faith looked back, they might have gone back. They might not have carried out what God assigned them to do. And so if you're tempted to give up and you're tempted to look back, and if the devil's doing a good job of saying what you used, how you used to live before Jesus is, was great and it's better, I just want to say, keep going. There's nothing back there for you. Keep moving forward. Paul is an amazing character in the Bible. He had a rough past before he met Jesus. And I love what he says in Philippians. He says, I don't look behind. I don't look behind me. I strain towards what is ahead to win the prize in Christ Jesus. That's what Christianity is all about. We, we don't look back, we move forward. We don't look back, we get better. We don't look back, we become more like Jesus and we live the lives that he's called us to live. And, and then... It, it goes on to say this in verse 16, instead of looking back, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared a city for them. Think about this real quick. When you're just passing through, when you understand that you're not gonna be somewhere for very long, maybe if you're visiting a city for the first time ever, maybe when you're on vacation, doesn't it cause you to live a little bit different Think about it. We live kind of in the St. Louis area. When's the last time you just went to the arch and just laid on the grass just to kick it for a day? You know, like I'm gonna get, you know, a mem some memorabilia just to commemorate my Saturday afternoon at the arch. I would, I would venture to say probably not many of us. When's the last time that you went to the art museum? When's the last time you went to the St. Louis Zoo? When's, when's the last time you went to Forest Park? When's the last time that you went to the Loop just to hang out? Here's the deal, I love St. Louis. I do, I love going to different restaurants and trying different things and seeing the different sites, but I think a lot of times I take St. Louis for granted because it's, it's my home. It's where I live. I, the arch is gonna be there in a couple years. Restaurant will probably be there in a couple years, right? And there's kind of a, a, a lack of a sense of urgency. Do you know when the last time I went to those places were most likely? City Museum, those type of places? When people were just passing through. When I had friends come in from Atlanta and different things, when people are in town, yeah, I love the arch, let's go. I love the city museum. Let's go, right? Like, let's go hang out at the loop. Let's see all the sights. It's amazing. I'm about to go to Folly Beach in a couple weeks and uh, with some friends, and we're going to go on a, on, on, a, on a short vacation. And my goal is I want to I wanna go to the cool restaurants. I want to see the sights. I want to play golf at the ocean course, Kiwa Island, but that's not going to happen because it's $350. I have to wait until I get home for that in heaven. Um, but, but, but I'm going to live a little bit different because there's a sense of urgency. And I think, I think that's what these people understood. These heroes of the faith understood that they were just passing through. They didn't have much time, so they had to make the most of every opportunity that God gave to them. And I think the same is true for us. 
We need to understand if we're gonna win our race, if we're gonna carry out the God-given assignment to love him and to love people and to point people to Jesus, we better understand that there has to be a sense of urgency that stems from the fact that we're just passing through. This is not our home. We're foreigners and we're strangers longing for home. There's a world-renowned uh, kind of atheist who, who lives in the United States of America and he travels around kind of having conversations and talking about how there's no God and there's no, you know, afterlife and all of it's a hoax. And, and I listen to uh, some of the stuff that he says and read some of his quotes and articles and different things just to kind of see where he's thinking and, and also because there are a lot of people in the world that kind of think that way. So, so I kind of think about some of the stuff that he says and it was about a year ago and I saw a video and, and I'll never forget what, what he said. And, and he was being debated by kind of a, a famous television personality. And, and there was a guy, and the guy was kind of debating him on the idea of death and afterlife and heaven and all of that, which is a hard topic kind of to discuss if you just think it, dying's the end. And, and I was pretty surprised by what he said. He said this. He said, understanding that there is no afterlife, understanding that there's no afterlife causes me to live every day with a sense of urgency. To love people, this is what he said, to make a difference. And then he goes on to say this, if I had all of eternity to do those things, why would I even get out of bed in the morning? And I remember, I remember thinking to myself, and I was kind of bummed when I heard him say that, because I'm like, oh, you're missing it. You're, you're missing the whole message of Christianity. You're missing the whole message of heaven and hell. You're missing the whole core message of everything that we believe. So if you're a Christian in the room today, we should think the, act, the exact opposite. Because there's an afterlife, because this is not our home, because in comparison to eternity, our time is short, we better make the most of every opportunity. We better love big and we better point people to Jesus before it's too late. That's what these heroes of the faith did in Hebrews chapter 11. And, and I love that passage of scripture. And while that passage points to all these heroes of the faith and Abraham and David and Noah and Isaac and all these, Sarah and, and all, these, all these heroes of the faith, we see clearly that in Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews 11 and these heroes of the faith, it's really just pointing to Jesus. The point of this whole passage is, is Abraham was amazing because he lived a lot like Jesus. Noah was amazing because in this area of his life, he lived a lot like Jesus. Sarah was awesome. She trusted God just a, a, lot, like, a lot like Jesus. And we see this in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 that we read earlier. Where, for the joy set before him, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So let's think about it as we round this out. What was his joy? What was Jesus Joy, because of his joy causes him to live a sinless life and die a brutal, day, brutal death for the sake of humanity. I want that joy. I want that joy. So, so what was it? And, it? and at first glance, you might think, well, his joy was that he was about to go sit at the right hand of the Father. Like for the joy set before him, endured the cross, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That was his joy. And I believe that that's part of it. But if you look at the narrative of scripture, if you read commentaries, you look at different scholars, we see that it goes a lot deeper than that. It's more than that. It's not that Jesus was just gonna be with his father, but it's that he was gonna be with you and with you and with you and with you and with me and everyone who would simply put their faith and trust in him. One theologian puts it this way. And, and I love this. He says, he looked, Jesus looked right through the cross. How can you look through the cross? Let's think about how crazy that is for a second. Looked right through the cross, the most gruesome event in all of human history. He looked right through the cross to the coming joy, the joy of bringing salvation to those he loves. Maybe there's someone in the room today and you've never heard of this. You don't know what's going on. And I just wanna say, I believe that Jesus looked past the cross at you. Jesus looked through the cross at you. So you're his joy. Whether you know it or not, you're his joy. You're his joy. You're his joy. I'm his joy. The fact that he's going to be with us forever. And can we just stop and say how crazy that is? Like, I think a lot of times we come up here and we talk about the cross and we talk about the love of God and blow right past it. This is the most, this is the greatest act of love in human history. 
Think about it. The horrors of Golgotha where he died, the horrors of crucifixion, the horrors of every sin in the history of humanity being laid on him paled into insignificance when he thought about the fact that he was gonna be with you and with you and with you and with you and with me forever and eternity. What an amazing love. I mean, this is the greatest love ever and this is the love that we're going to experience forever. This is the love that we're going to experience forever. And again, his joy, his joy was rooted in eternity. It wasn't some temporal joy that was caused by things that were happening in his, in his life and in his world. No, it was a joy that was rooted in eternity. And let me ask the question, is that your joy? Is that your joy? Is it, be, because may I be so bold, this might sound weird, but I believe that Christians, if this message is true, should be the most consistently happy people in the world. And that doesn't mean that we're floating on clouds and that doesn't mean that life, get, that life doesn't get tough. But I believe that as Christians, the overarching theme of our lives should be joy. We should be the most joyful people in the world. Look what Jesus says in John 15, nine through 11. He says, as the father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love, kind of what we talked about last week. Just sit at my feet, be my friend, enjoy my love. If you keep my commands, you remain in my love. Just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. And then he says this, I've told you this. I've told you this so that my joy, what's his joy? His joy is the joy that's rooted in eternity. The fact that we get to be with him forever and he gets to be with us forever. He says so that my joy may be in you so that it may be your joy and your joy may be complete. Come on, his joy can be our joy. A joy that in the midst of tough challenges and circumstances and times where we're tempted to give up, we can keep going because man, there is a reward that is greater than anything we could possibly imagine. This isn't our home, it's not, but we're going there. I, I remember I was giving a sermon uh, at the edge to some of our students uh, a couple semesters ago, I think. And, and we were talking about the idea of eternity. And normally I don't really go off script much when I'm up, up here. I uh, just try and keep to what I wrote and, and the process. But I remember I was up there and I love student ministry and I love being involved up here with our students. It's the joy of a lifetime. And, and, and I remember this passage became so much more real to me as I'm looking out at a bunch of students that I've come to love and know and I started thinking, and I started saying this out loud, kind of thinking out loud, this is why I love it so much, guys. This is, this is what makes me love what I do so much because this isn't just like a four-year thing. <laughs> like this isn't just we're gonna experience high school together and we're gonna navigate it and you're gonna love Jesus and it's gonna be awesome. Hey, middle schoolers, this is why I love it so much. It's not just gonna be a six-year thing. No, this is a forever thing. We're gonna be with each other in heaven forever. So you better get used to me, right? Like, like, like I, I was so excited and I'm I pumped up and it's just mega joy, right? I, I'm bummed, I'm bummed right now. If I'm gonna be honest, I'm bummed right now that some of the students that I've gotten to know really well over the past few years are about to go away to college. That's just the reality, okay? It's kind of one of the, you know, not necessarily the first year, but it's kind of, this is a group that we've been with for a long time. And, and I'm, a little, I'm a little bummed. Like, I feel like that's healthy, you know? And I'm kind of sad, like they're going away to school. I'm not gonna see them as much and all this. And then I give a talk like this. And I'm not trying to sound super spiritual, but you hear this and you're like, what's four years? What's four years? Even if they never come back, what is this life in comparison to eternity? We're gonna be with each other forever. And the same is true for us this morning in this room. We aren't here at Oak Bridge just to go for a good ride for 10, 20, 30 years. We're not. No, like this is a forever kind of thing. We're gonna be with each other in heaven forever. What joy this brings. And it's not just going to be us. It's, not, it's going to be our brothers and sisters from every nation and tribe and tongue and every race and every nationality and every color. And it's going to be beyond our wildest dreams. And we're not just going to be with them. We're not just going to be with us, but we're going to be with Jesus. We're gonna be with Jesus, the one who died for us, the one who loves us more than we could ever possibly imagine. We're literally like in the flesh. We're gonna be able to sit at his feet. We're gonna be able to get on our knees and worship him and praise him for who he is, for what he's done. We're gonna see his scars. We're gonna to listen to him talk. It's gonna be the most amazing thing ever. And I just wanna close with this. There's a guy named John and, and he was given a vision into what heaven would look like. And he writes this in Revelation chapter five. He says, then I saw 
in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. The writer says, I wept and I wept because no one was found who is worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then, then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has triumphed and he is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, Jesus, you purchased for God every person from every tribe and language and people and nation. You've made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders and in a loud voice, they were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. I knew that I was gonna be giving a talk on heaven over a month ago. And I was thinking, what do you say? We could talk about this for a whole year. And so I started thinking about, you know, what we would say. And, and I started thinking about home because heaven is our home. We're, we're made for heaven. We weren't designed to die. That wasn't God's original plan. And so heaven is our home. I started thinking about home. What am I gonna say about home? What, what comes to mind when I think about home? And so I started thinking, when I think about home, my house isn't the first thing that comes to mind. Like the basketball court in the backyard isn't the first thing that comes to mind. When I think about my home church here, I don't, I don't necessarily think about the building. I think about the people, the people who I love, the people that I'm with. And, and that's what I wanna acknowledge right here. Like heaven's gonna be awesome and all this crazy stuff and colors and all that, but that pales in comparison to the fact that we're gonna be with each other and we're gonna be with Jesus. And we're gonna join all the angels and every nation and every tribe. And we're gonna say worthy is the lamb to receive honor and glory and power and praise, and it's gonna be beyond our wildest comprehension. Last week, we said that we need to focus on Jesus more. I'm 100% standing by that statement. I think we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. But I also think for a lot of us, we need to fix our eyes on the reward. We need to fix our eyes on home. We need to fix our eyes on heaven and what that's gonna be like, because I believe that when we do, when we understand that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can fully comprehend what God has prepared for those that he loves, I believe that, man, it changes things. When we understand that we're just foreigners, we're just strangers on the earth, we begin to love more, we begin to reach out more, we, we begin to point more people to the love of Jesus. And I believe that that motivation, the same joy and the same motivation that got Jesus, okay, through the cross, I believe it's gonna be what gets us through this life and gets us to the finish line. And when we do, when we do, as we close out this series, I just keep going, keep going, keep moving forward, keep loving Jesus, keep loving people, do all that you can to win the race because when we reach that finish line, what a joy it will be when we meet our creator, when we meet our savior face to face and he's gonna look every one of us in the eye and he's gonna say, well done, well done, good, and faithful servant. You fought the good fight. You kept the, you, kept the, you kept the faith. You finished your course. You won your race. Let's pray. God, we love you. We're grateful for, for, for just these past four weeks and just for the realities that, that we get to just think about and the realities that we get to live in. And so God, my prayer 
after a series like this, for, for those of us that have been here, is I just pray it wasn't just a collection of talks. I pray that it wasn't just some information and some stories that we got to hear, but God, I pray that, that it, was, it was time together and it was time with you and it was your word that's gonna shape the way that we live our lives. And so God, I pray, I pray a prayer over all of us and I pray that we have the courage to, to get rid of the sin in our lives and continue battling the things that so easily entangle us. And God, I pray that we endure and I pray that we persevere and I pray for the person in the room right now where life's hard and it's challenging and honestly, it would, it would, be, it would probably be easier to give up. God, I pray for them and I pray that all of us together can keep our eyes fixed on Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of faith. And just like Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, I pray that we can keep that joy in front of us. I pray that we can look to the finish line. I pray that we can look to the reward, understanding that we are foreigners, we are strangers here, and we need to make the most of every opportunity that we have. Help us win the race like you've called us to. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Let's stand up and let's sing this song. You are the word of the beginning, the one with God, the Lord most high, hidden glory and creation, now revealed in you, our Christ, what a beautiful name. What a beautiful name.
Give Josh a round of applause. I just love this series so much. Just thank you. You know, uh, time is short on this earth. It really is. And everybody needs the opportunity to know the Jesus that we've been introduced to. The, the one of, full of grace and love and truth and hope and mercy. The one that gives us power to live. The one that lives in us. This past week, on, uh, during the week, I was invited to come speak to a friend of mine who's a year behind me. And he, the doctors have told him he's got about two to three weeks left on this earth. And he's a Christian. And uh, we talked for a while, and uh, a couple of things that I asked him was, I said, you know, do you ever like just sitting out, sitting outside? He's struggling in the last stages of throat cancer. He's been battling it for a couple years. And he says, yeah, I like to sit outside. And he says, I love to see the trees. They're beautiful. He says, I love to see, uh, you know, snow when it falls. And so we, we talked a little while about what was beauty to look at. We mentioned a roaring ocean. Uh, we mentioned the, the trees in fall. We mentioned a bird that flies overhead. We mentioned a fat, chubby little baby, you know, that's just born where you just want to kiss him on the cheek and just hold him and hold him. And we said there are so many things that you look at, a sunset with the clouds glistening, you know, and the pinks and the reds and the yellows. They're just breathtaking. And he said, yeah, he says, I, I find comfort right now. I'm just sitting and looking. And I said, do you find comfort with anything else? And he says, I, he says Tom, he says, the hymns, the old hymns mean something a lot more to me now. And he said, I'm in great pain. There's not much they can do for my pain now. And he said, but I listen to the music. And uh, when we sing the great pa praises to God and the contemporary music, he says, it just does something inside of me. He says, it just helps my ears and it helps my soul and my heart. Then I told him, I said, you know what's amazing is the Apostle Paul tells us that no eye has seen no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. And I said, you know what? It's amazing that you haven't seen anything, the best sunset, the best snowfall, that compares to your first glimpse when you're with your father in heaven. You haven't heard anything yet. And, and these gals, when they sang today, just sound like angels, don't they? Our whole band sounds like angels. I said, but... You haven't heard anything, Tommy, until you hear the 10 million angels sing. The, the, the music will be so sweet and so healing to you. And I said, you know what? You're a step away from an upgrade. And he says, I know it. And he says, and I'm so thankful for my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who's going to be there to greet me and usher me into a place that's really an eternal vacation. And... Uh, that's why we do church. That's why we're here. That's why you love your kids. That's why you love your grandkids. That's why you love your friends. That's why in the dormitories you, you try and point people towards Jesus. Because this life is short and it's about fixing our eyes on the one who loves us most. And that gives us a hope that this world knows not of. It gives us a strength that we don't normally have. So I just encourage all you guys to lean into that, to continue to fix your eyes on Jesus, continue to be cheerleaders for the kingdom. Tell as many people as you can. And we'll just try and this week, next week, just reach one more person for Jesus. And we'll do that together. I want to say a prayer, then close you with something else. Father, just thank you. For the person whose heart you stirred, maybe for the first time today. To want to know and trust your son, Jesus. Father, I thank you for that. For those of us that have taken a step back, that we know that we're just less empty. There's just more of, of nothing without you. We thank you that you bring us back into the fold. No matter what we've done or what we've said, you want us back pursuing and trusting your son. God, I thank you for every person in this room that's helped make this possible through their generosity, their serving, their prayers. Father, I pray your blessings upon every family that's here and that's watching online. It's in your son's name we pray, amen. Next week, we have a special 4th of July service that we do not want you to miss. And then we start a three-week series that's called How to Respond to God When It Seems Like God's Not Responding to You. And I promise you that series is one that you do not want to miss. Hope to see all you guys next week. Thanks for coming. Have a good day.
side. 